Hi, I'm Brian Schiffman, the President and CEO of the Vaughn Chamber of Commerce. <clears throat> I wanted to welcome you all this morning to our uh, business seminar online, part of our res business uh, resource series. Uh, we've been trying to work with you, our members, <clears throat> during this really difficult time to help you through this crisis by bringing you seminars that uh, help you learn about challenges that uh, you're, we can talk about the challenges you're facing and work through some of those, provide some calm, some clarity. Our first uh, business resource series, we actually had uh, Frank Fazari from Fazari and Partners, an accountant. Today, we're gonna be focusing on employment law. We've also done a series of town halls with elected officials at all levels of government. Again, our goal is to try and help you through this crisis and work through the various challenges that you're facing and what's been sent to us by email. We have a host of questions on employment law that we've received. So today's speaker has been gracious enough to put together a presentation based on what she's hearing, uh, questions from business on employment law, and also what we're hearing as well at the chamber. I did wanna thank, uh, before I formally introduce Ina from Miller Thompson, I wanted to thank uh, VBEC, the Vaughn Business Enterprise Center for supporting this series as well as uh, Mike from Render Media for, uh, for live webcasting. We appreciate the support. I wanted to remind everybody at home, <clears throat> we're certainly there for you. We've reached out to over 450 of you personally, and we've heard from you. We've been sending your concerns and your challenges to government. We've been working through those. Uh, we also, um, we're very much open to any feedback you have for us. I would encourage you, if you are able to sell in this market, use our Facebook Marketplace. We started that recently and uh, that's completely free for members to use. Um, and I would recommend that you go to the Vine Chamber website often at the homepage it says COVID-19 business resources. Uh, click that, it takes you to all the business resources being provided, business supports by government. And from there, you can also get business tips from employment lawyers and accountants and other professionals. So without further ado, I did wanted to welcome our friend, Ina Koldor from Miller Thompson. She's uh, been practicing employment law for about 16 years, uh, had her own uh, firm, and we know her from that time through the chamber, and now she's a partner at Miller Thompson, one of our uh, long-term supporters, and uh, I think you've been there about three years. So uh, welcome, and thanks for working through some of the challenges our businesses are facing. Uh, thank you, Brian. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, as you know, Miller Thompson has been an active member of the Chamber for many years, and many of our clients are also members of the Chamber. So I'm happy to be here and to share the information that we shared with our clients with the broader business community in Vaughan. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So I think you're going to you're going to give a presentation, which I mentioned, uh, encompassing a lot of the questions that we've been getting and you've been hearing as well. Uh, so I'll um, I just encourage. Yeah, let's let's go for it. Okay, I'm just going to uh, put up some slides uh, for everyone to see. Okay, so um, we, you know, we, we can actually just so you know, we, we can see um, a, a Word document open as well. Oh, could you? Okay, and I'm trying to just kind of figure out which screen I'm sharing where. So give me one moment. Um, just click on that. Yeah. Okay. I am. Um, hang on. Oh, it's technical no difficulties, right? No worries. Okay. Everybody's learning. We're all at technology is it again. It's right when it works. Can we see my slides? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Great. Okay. So. Um, we've received a lot of different questions from businesses with respect to the different programs that the government is offering, and that, that has been a consistent issue that's been coming up. So I wanted to start by outlining those, uh, and I'm going to start with the programs that the government has um, offered to businesses specifically. And the one that everybody's probably heard about is the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. And this has been talked about for a number of weeks now by the federal government. It was introduced back in March. Um, and through it, the federal government uh, has, is planning to reimburse an employer for up to 75% of an employee's wages or up to $847 per week, whichever is lower, for wages paid during three periods covering roughly March, April, and May of 2020. So once an employer qualifies for one period, the employer qualifies for all the three per periods as well. The employer applies for subsequent periods for the subsidy. Uh, there's no limit on the amount of subsidy an employer can get. The limit is only on the wages per employee per week that are being subsidized. 
And the subsidy, uh, the federal government had tried to go wide with this one. So it applies to individuals, to corporations, nonprofit organizations, charitable organizations, and certain partnerships. So certainly they tried to encompass as many private sector employers as they could. Uh, to qualify for the subsidy, a business will have to show that it, um, uh, it received a 15%, um, at least 15% lower revenue in March and a reduction in revenue of at least 30% in April and May. And the comparison period for the program's purposes is either the same month in 2019 or an average revenue in January and February of this year. And once as a business you pick a comparison period, you have to stick to it through, throughout the program. So you cannot go back and forth depending on the month. The way that the uh, wage subsidy is set up, it's actually retroactive. So the government expects employers to subsidize employees' wages up front and then apply for, for the uh, reimbursement uh, at a later date. Um, and so this creates a little bit of uncertainty for businesses because um, unless a business is sure that they're going to qualify and nobody can be sure just yet before you apply, you're really subsidize, subsidizing this up front and hoping that you're going to get reimbursement at the end of the day. But again, because of the way that it was set up and the government's really tried to be inclusive, if you do have that reduction in revenue, chances are that you're going to qualify for the program. The uh, legislation when it comes to, the, to this program states that the business should try to um, do everything that it can to subsidize the additional 25% of wages, but there's actually no requirement to. So if it, as a business you're unable to do that, then the employee will receive the 75% wage subsidy. And depending on circumstances and how you set up this wage subsidy, you may not have to pay the remaining 25%. If an employer pays the wages of an employee who is not working, but is rather on a paid leave and then gets reimbursed for those wages, then as an employer, you can also claim a reimbursement for the employer paid CPP and EI deductions as well. Uh, and those are only for full weeks that the employee is not working. So keep that in mind. That's an extra deduction that, that uh, as a business you can have in your pocket. And if an employee is not working, but is being paid and you're applying for the subsidy, you should have them on a paid leave rather than a layoff. And that's an important uh, difference because the legislation itself um, refers to paid leave. And so you wanna make sure it's in a leave, not in a layoff, or otherwise you may or may not be, be denied the subsidy. Um, the wage subsidy is also not going to be paid for employees who are not paid for 14 days or more because those employees are expected to apply for the serve benefits, which we're going to discuss in a few minutes. The application is through the Revenue Canada portal. So if you've never used that portal, now is a good time to go and familiarize yourself with it, make sure that you're able to access it. Earlier this week, the government released a calculator on the portal, uh, which uh, actually, if, when you click on the link, you get a spreadsheet that you can use to calculate the wage subsidy that you can receive. Um, the portal will be open as of this Monday for applications. So if you have time between now and Monday, I encourage you to go on the, on the uh, Canada Revenue Agency website, download the spreadsheet and do your calculations now uh, because the system is probably going to be overloaded on Monday. And so at that time, you can just go on and apply for your subsidy. So if you have time, you can do that. If you can't find it, just shoot me a quick email and I'll send you the link to it. So that is the greater wage subsidy that the federal government has offered that I think a lot of businesses are going to take advantage of. Before that was offered, though, the government also offered a 10% wage subsidy for employers. Uh, and right now, employers who don't qualify for the greater wage subsidy can still continue to take advantage of this 10% wage subsidy. Um, and this wage subsidy is paid for the period of March 18th to June 19th, but it's limited. It's limited to up to 10% of an employee's wages and up to $1,375 per eligible em employee. And the employer can only recover $25,000 in total for all employees together. So it is a lot more limited than the, the greater wage subsidy. Um, there's no application needed in this case. Uh, what you do is you calculate your subsidy and you, you deduct it from the remittances that you make to the CRA um, with your payroll. And so that's, it's a very simple process and uh, it's been available for a number of weeks for now. And if you haven't taken advantage of it, I encourage you to go on there, especially if you don't qualify for the greater wage subsidy uh, and take a look and see whether this is something that you can do for your business. I think it's also important to mention that the government very clearly said that you can't apply to both. So if you qualify for the greater subsidy, you can't get the 10% subsidy as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. You will have to deduct whatever you've already received under the smaller subsidy from the larger one when you apply. Yeah. So that, you know, I, th I think that's a really important distinction. So can you just state that last part again about uh, you could go for both, but you're going to be deducting one from the other. 
you should be. And what we don't know yet, because the, the program has is not up and running just yet, is whether the government's going to do it on its end. If you still try to claim both, we don't know whether there are going to be any fines associated with it. Um, there's nothing in legislation, I don't think, that states that there will be fines or any penalties, but there may be. So if you've already received the 10% or applied for it, um, you will you should deduct it from your application for the greater wage subsidy. Thank you. So this is what the government has done with respect to subsidies. Um, it, the federal government has also offered some loans, and the one that's uh, most talked about is the Canada Emergency Business Account Program. And this is an interest-free loan of up to $40,000 that's offered, offered to small businesses, so those with a payroll between $20,000 and $1.5 in 2019. Um, and that's what, so that's what you need to qualify for your payroll to be that size. The loan is administered through your financial institution, so you can just apply directly through whichever financial institution you're dealing with as a business. And if you pay back the loan in full before the end of 2022, you get 25% of it uh, forgiven. So it's a bit of a grant as well. And we found that a lot of our clients, the smaller clients, have applied for this loan to be able to subsidize their wages to get the subsidy from the government. So it, it does help if you're not able to afford payroll, if your employees aren't working, but want to take advantage of the wage subsidy. And there are also a number of tax filing deferrals that the government, the federal government has offered. The bond chamber, uh, like Brian mentioned, has a list of all of the programs. There should be something for everyone. So <clears throat> please go ahead and take a look at the list and see if there's anything that, that fits, uh, fits your needs. Um, in Ontario, the provincial government has offered a couple of things uh, on a smaller scale. It has introduced an increase of the employer health tax exemption to 1 million from the previous 490,000 and that's retroactive to January 1st. And it's also allowing employers to defer WSIB premium reporting and payments until August 31st without any penalty or interest. So those are a couple of breaks that uh, the provincial government is offering to employers. Brian, did you want me to go ahead and start talking about employee benefits or do you have any questions about these? No, I, <clears throat> well, I, I think uh, other than the one thing I wanted to restate is that again, that with the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, which so many of our members are waiting for, it, as Ina mentioned, it does open on Monday. I, I think that was good advice. We've heard that from our accounting friends as well to, to get on that portal in advance of Monday. Now, you could certainly apply on Tuesday or Wednesday, um, but some of you are, are going to be trying to do it right away because the sooner you apply, the sooner you get the payments. We've heard from our friends at the federal government, there's going to be a real emphasis to pay these out quickly. Uh, and um, just for those watching at home, we will do further um, town halls or business seminars where we get into specifically that portal and uh, talk about the accounting implications and but I, but I would, I wanted to restate that because I think that's an important point you've made, Ina. And yeah, I would love to hear programs for employees. And before we get off uh, that topic as well, Brian, I think that because this is a reimbursement for something you've already paid, there really isn't a rush to apply right on Monday. Um, I know that there have been with a couple of the other benefit programs, there have been some um, difficulty getting on the sites the first day. So certainly if you can't get on on Monday, then try again on Tuesday. It is a reimbursement. So you you would have already paid the, the wages at that point. Anyways. No, that's, that's good advice. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, this, so that was those were employer benefits. Employee benefits are a little different. Um, most people by now have heard of the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, or the CERB, as most people call it, and that provides a benefit of two thousand dollars a month. It's a, basically a flat benefit for up to four months to workers who either lost income as a result of COVID nineteen because they're not working, or are only earning up to one thousand dollars per month because of the COVID nineteen crisis or where they were not working prior to COVID-19, but were on regular EI benefits that have now run out and can find a job because of the COVID-19 crisis. So it's open to a large segment of people. Um, it's available to any worker of at least 15 years of age who earned $5,000 either in 2019 or in the 12 months leading up to the application for the program. And the worker has to be without employment and income for 14 days to qualify for service. Um, the benefit applied to any, applies to any four-week period during the period of March 15 to October 3rd. So you could apply for one month, and then if there is some work for you, you can take that work and then apply for in a subsequent month um, where you don't have income again. You don't have to apply four months in a row. So that is the CERB. And then a couple of weeks ago, when it may have been last week even, the federal government also introduced a top-up for low-income essential workers. The idea is that any essential workers who are earning less than $2,500 a month will be talked up to that, that uh, level. 
We don't have any details yet. It, it's not in play just yet, uh, but we're expecting details to come out very shortly. And then on Wednesday of this week, the Prime Minister announced a couple of programs for students. He announced the Canada Emergency Student Benefit, and that is the benefit that's going to be provided to students and recent graduates who are not eligible for the SERB benefits, presumably because they haven't had any income in the last 12 months or in 2019. And um, students with no income at all or with income of less than $1,000 per month are eligible for this program. The benefit is going to be lower than the SERB benefit. It's $12.50 a month for eligible students, or if the student has a dependent or disabilities, then up to $17.50 a month. Um, the benefit will be available from May to August of 2020. And together with this benefit, the, the government also announced that it's going to create 116,000 jobs, placements, and other training opportunities for students but we don't yet have information in which sectors or how exactly it's going to go about doing that. And the last thing that it announced with respect to students is a grant. So the expectation is the students donate their time um, in sectors that require volunteer time right now during the pandemic. And then so long as that specific volunteer job is approved by the government, the student will receive a grant of up to $5,000 toward education in the fall. So that's something to keep in mind as well if you have a student at home. So those are the main employee side uh, benefits that were announced in the last couple of weeks, Brian. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think we'll get back into some of those a little later as well, if there's time, but we wanted to go into uh, some of the options for businesses uh, in terms of temporary layoffs. Um, one of the questions we received from a business are, is uh, are temporary layoffs the only option that a business has that does not have work for an employee? And this is, again, a question that comes up again and again, and their temporary layoffs, I think that that's a term that people often use to basically refer to employees who are not working. Um, but you need to know that there are more options than just that. Um, and temporary layoffs, I'll talk about that in a second. But one of the options you may want to take advantage of is the infectious disease emergency leave. And this is a new, it's not a new leave so much as an amended leave. The emergency leave has been in the Employment Standards Act for a long time unused for the most part, and then it was amended to fit the COVID-19 situation. So in the Employment Standards Act, under the Infectious Disease Emergency Leave, you can put an employee on leave. It is a job protective leave, so the employee has to be able to return back to work after. It's an un unpaid leave, and the benefit of it is that it doesn't have a time limit. It, the leave is, is in place so long as there is an emergency order. And right now, although we know that the emergency order keeps on getting pushed uh, for a couple of weeks each time, I don't think there's much of an end in sight at this point to it. So it'll be going on for a while. Um, and it's for anyone really who's affected by COVID-19, anyone who is affected by the school closures and has children at home that they have to take care of, or whose job has disappeared because businesses have to shut down and can, can no longer operate because of the emergency leave. So, so long as it's connected to the emergency order out there, the employer can actually put an employee on this leave, an unpaid leave, and, and have them um, not work. So that's the first option. The second option are those temporary layoffs that you keep on hearing about in the news. And this is a good option for businesses who can remain operational, either because they're an emergency, uh, an essential service or because they can, can continue to operate remotely, but who are affected by the crisis and can't uh, provide work to employees right now. You can't technically go on the emergency leave because you can continue operating, um, but the Employment Standards Act permits you to lay employees off temporarily for a couple of periods. There are a couple of um, stages to it. You can either temporarily lay off an employee for 13 weeks in any 20 week period, or if you want to, if you can and want to continue the employee's group benefits or pension contributions, the employee can go on layoff for up to 35 weeks in any 52 week period. The temporary layoffs do not have to be used all at once. So you can put an employee on a temporary layoff and if some work comes in, you can recall them for a period of time and then put them back on the layoff. So long as the layoff doesn't pass the 13 weeks and 20 week period or the, the 35 weeks in a 50 week period, the 52 week period. Um, there's no notice requirement. So you can put an employee on a temporary layoff today for tomorrow. And uh, you all, the only thing that is very important to remember is that you have to recall the employee within the time period that the layoff allows you. If you don't recall the employee within the 13 or 35 weeks, then the employee is deemed terminated and you get into the area of having to pay them termination pay and severance pay depending on the situation. So make sure that you recall them back to work within the time period. So that's option two. 
And then option three is to terminate the employment of employees. And this is good for businesses who either know that they're not going to be reopening after the, the crisis is over, or you know that you're going to be reopening in a different, some sort of reincarnation, and you may not have certain jobs available, or you know right now that this specific employee isn't an employee you, you are going to bring back for a business reason. So in that case, uh, the recommendation is to terminate them now, because if you put them on a temporary layoff or on a leave, their seniority continues to accumulate and you terminate them six months or a year from now, you'll probably owe them more in termination pay um, and in severance pay. So if you know they're going to not return to work, it may be a good time to terminate them at their employment. So these are, these are the three, three main options for employers who don't have work for their employees right now. Um, you know, can you, uh, do, and also I wanted to encourage those watching from home, uh, feel free to post your questions for us because we're gonna get to some of those a little later. Can you, um, if you go back a little bit to the distinction between the 13 weeks or the longer uh, period where you can put them on temporary leave, can you explain that again? Sure. Um, and so the, the distinction really between the two time periods is the employer's continuation of either group benefits or pension contributions on behalf of the employee. So if you do have a group benefits program and you're able to continue paying the premiums for the employee during the leave, then you can, turn, you can lay them off for a period of 35 weeks, up to 35 weeks. If this is not something that you can do or you do not have a group benefits program or a pension that you're paying into for the employee, then your, your time limit is 13 weeks in any 20 week period that you can temporarily lay them off. So, so I get the question that I've received from some members has to do with the distinction on continuing to pay the benefits and the pension. Um, some some businesses might look to scale down the benefits but continue to offer them or perhaps offer the full benefits but scale or scale back the pension or vice versa. Are these things a business can do? Mm -hmm. Or can, can they do that to get the 35 weeks you mean? Yeah, mm -hmm. like if it, will they still, if so, if you continue to offer benefits to get the 35 weeks but you scale down the benefits, for example, dental, um, mm -hmm. because people aren't using it very actively, would you still qualify? For the 35 weeks, that's a good question. I actually don't know the answer to it because it's not a situation that happens very often. Uh, okay. Typically, the expectation when you put an employee on either leave or, or a layoff or, you know, for whatever reason, they're not working, is in any event to continue their benefits um, as they are. I think that if you're making any changes to the employee's employment like that, it may not give you the benefit of the 35 weeks. But I can get back to you on that once I take a look at it. Yeah, sure. That'd be great. I mean, you know, because it's so it's such an abnormal time, I've heard every kind of question, business trying to be very creative. And and I think overwhelmingly businesses are trying to obviously they're trying to preserve cash, but they're trying to protect their employees as well. So mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, there's a lot of different scenarios we're seeing, as you wouldn't be surprised, and I'm sure you're getting that too. Now, yes. if you, if you, there's been a, a few news reports that if you give um, an employee uh, a temporary leave, that's constructive dismissal. Is that true? Um, maybe, <laughs> like with many things. I, I know it's been a lot in the news lately, and um, I, I think that what's important to remember is that this is all based on judge-made law. So the Employment Standards Act permits employers to take advantage of these temporary layoffs. Uh, but then when employers do, you take advantage of them. Um, employees sometimes sue for constructive dismissal and you have different judges giving different opinions and cases on that. So there are some cases out there that say that if a, a layoff right isn't present in the employment contract, then the employee was um, wrongfully terminated, constructively dismissed in common law and is entitled to damages. There are also cases out there that say just the opposite, that it's because the employer has the right in the Employment Standards Act, it may not, it does not need to have the, um, the right in an employment contract as well. So you can find cases um, that say um, both, both of these views. Our advice, or my advice has, has been to date, that an employee who's constructively dismissed, let's even say that this is a constructive dismissal, that an employer put an employee on a temporary layoff. The employee has uh, an obligation to mitigate by taking the job and returning to work. So if you as an employer are putting an employee on a constructive on a um, temporary layoff and the employee's claiming constructive dismissal, if you offer them their job back, if you recall them back, they have to take that job back and come back to work as mitigation. Otherwise, they won't be able to claim constructive dismissal in court. So that's important to remember practically. If you need to temporarily lay off, make sure you offer their job back because that's good protection for you, especially if they don't take it and then claim constructive dismissal later. And I think that we also have to remember that the judges are probably, and it's a guess, but I think that they're probably going to relax the rules around this anyways if these cases get to court because everybody's in a situation where there is less work, 
there are mandatory shutdowns and judges take real life into consideration when they're making decisions. So that's important to remember as well. And I think the last thing is that most employees would be happy to have a job to come back to in this situation. And so I, I know there's been a lot of talk uh, about constructive dismissal, but we don't know how many employees will actually take that position considering you know, the, economic, uh, the economic situation out there and the fact that they would be happy to come back to work and have a job to come back to. So take all those into consideration and know that there's a risk, um, but that you should just operate your business to the extent that you can within the confines of the law always, of course, but um, make sure that you recall them back to work. I think that's your best protection. So if you, if you had a crystal ball, though, do you think it's fair to assume that regardless how this turns out, we're going to see a whole series of court cases on or mediation on constructive dismissal when there's a recovery? I think there will be. There, there was a big push by some lawyers in the media about this, employee side lawyers. So I, I, I do think that uh, there, will be a, uh, there will certainly be some cases that will come out of it. Um, my sense, again, just from knowing that judges always look at the real life out there, that they will cut employers some slack with, with this, but obviously there's no way to tell. I'm sure, I'm sure some judges will stick to the letter of the law um, as it is now be, or as it was before the COVID-19 situation. But the, these types of situations, these types of economic crises change the law. I mean, that's why you get different, uh, the, the law changing over time. So I do expect some change in the law and that's constructive dismissal because of the situation right now. Okay, and um, I, I did receive this question on um, on um, temporary layoffs. Uh, are there other names for temporary layoffs? Because some businesses have uh, laid people off, but they call it something slightly different. Um, are there are there different terms, or they might be totally different kind of uh, leaves? There, there's a U.S. term called furlough that I know a lot of people refer to, uh, which is really equivalent to a temporary layoff. It's just the U.S. term for it. So I've heard that a little bit. From, uh, from some companies. But other than that, it's called a temporary layoff. That's, that's what most people refer to. Um, bec an actual layoff is typically a termination. So I know there is a much of a difference in the language, but a temporary layoff, the word temporary is, is key. So, wait, but if you, if you were given a temporary leave, as an example, is that the same thing? So, a leave, that, uh, yeah, a leave is a little different because. Um, a leave is a little different. It's not a layoff. Um, there are certain leaves in the Employment Standards Act that you will typically try to fit yourself into. If you can't, you can just go on a general leave or the employer can put you on one in that situation. Uh, but a leave is a different from a layoff. But I know a lot of people, uh, a lot of businesses mix up the language because at the end of the day, the effect is the same for them, right? The employee isn't working. Um, and so I know that there's been some back and forth in the terms. Okay, well, th thank you for, that's th that helps to clarify actually. Um, we uh, are there. What can businesses that are not essential services continue to operate? That was the next question that we received. Yes, uh, they can. Um, the emergency order basically prohibits businesses who are not essential services from operating physically in a physical location. But certainly, if, if you're not an essential service and you can continue to operate online or remotely, you certainly can continue to operate. There's no prohibition against that. And I think it's an and important condition. And actually, I'm gonna, I'll jump in as well. So, so we've seen certainly the, the essential services list has and will change over time. Uh, some businesses that are essential services have chosen to close down, even though they're essential services, they can close down their actual physical office, but still be running from home. Uh, other businesses, like Ina said, if you, if you are not an essential service, you can still operate from home. Uh, and then there's the distinction of some businesses, obviously you can do curbside pickup, uh, I'd say for, for the nuance of your particular situation, you should each either reach out directly to the bond chamber and we'll help you and we'll direct you to the right level of government uh, or, or just on the chamber's website, when you look at business resources, the essential services page, you could go directly to your local MP or uh, MPP if you, but again, the chamber will help you if you need some support that way. Well, let's see what, uh, actually, why don't we go, we got a question online. So if, if that's okay, I'll ask you this one now. Sure. Uh, this question comes from uh, Anastasia um, LaPlante. An employer can't use the wage subsidy to pay an employee on SERP. What happens if employees refuse work when recalled because they earn more on SERP? When they're called from, oh, they're on leave right now. Yeah, so they'd be on leave, they, they get called back and they refuse to work because they get paid more on the SERP than they would in the job. 
I, I mean, I think they have to make a business decision in that case. They obviously can continue to, to uh, receive the serve. The serve is so broad that whether they are on layoff and on leave or terminated, they can continue to receive the serve. Um, so I think you have to make a business decision with respect to this employee. Um, or what I've heard a couple of clients do is actually top up employees' wages to the serve um, to the serve level because okay, you make you uh, get yeah. every single time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now another one we wanted to cover was for for those businesses which are non essential services. What changes can they expect to have to make to their workplaces when the emergency order is lifted? So. Um, Yesterday, actually, this is very timely because yesterday Saskatchewan has announced that it's going to begin reopening the province starting May 4th. Um, and everybody's been waiting for one of the provinces to take the lead on this because this is going to be something that takes quite a bit of pro planning. And it is the first province in Canada to, to announce that it's going to be doing that. So it published a five phase plan to methodically and gradually reopen businesses and services. And physical distancing and cleaning and disinfecting procedures still play a very prominent role in all five of those phases. So it gives us a bit of a glimpse into what Ontario is likely to do, at least in part, when it is ready to start, to start uh, rolling things out again. Um, so the Saskatchewan plan, and I'm just going to give you a couple of uh, pieces of information about it, and then I'm going to tell you what I think is going to have to happen. Um, so the plan in Saskatchewan limits the capacity of some businesses. So for example, restaurants, once they're ready to open, I think in phase three of the plan, will have to limit their regular capacity to 50% uh, for some time. Um, public gatherings under the plan will be limited to 10 and then 15 and then 30 people in the foreseeable future. And in fact, the plan recommends that businesses and workplaces follow those guidelines as well. So businesses and workplaces do not have to limit the, uh, the number of people in, in the physical space, but it, it is recommended that they will. Um, and then the last three phases of the plan that they've released don't have a date yet. They're waiting to see what happens in phase one and two and whether things go well and the virus doesn't spread any further before putting dates on, um, on the other phases. And interestingly, the state of emergency in Saskatchewan is going to stay in place throughout the five-phase program, which, which will take months to implement. Uh, as do the schools. Schools continue to be closed, and there's still a prohibition on travel. So this just gives you an idea of what Ontario is likely to do as well. So like Saskatchewan, I think that when the green light is given in Ontario for non-essential businesses to start opening up again, I'm also guessing that it's going to be gradual and kind of sector by sector and that social distancing is going to remain a, um, a main um, feature of, of the plan and as well health uh, restrictions and so on. So some of the things that businesses should consider is for example, the reconfiguration of uh, layout in, of workspaces. This may mean uh, moving workstations around or using your boardrooms or other shared areas as work areas because you have to have people a certain uh, number of feet apart or because you can't have more than a certain amount of people in one room. Um, some businesses will likely have to create barriers like we see in grocery stores with plexiglass or other solid screens or dividers, uh, maybe limit the, the use of shared equipment. So if now you have 30 or 40 people sharing your, your printer, you may have to limit that. Um, it, Factories may have to, to redesign production lines. Uh, open spaces will have to be redesigned probably as well. Creating extra corridors for employees to pass through so they're not too close to one another. And maybe even placing markings on the ground like you see in grocery stores to make sure that people know not to get close to one another. Because again, in Saskatchewan, those, um, those restrictions aren't actually lifted, the, the physical distancing restrictions. So that's one thing you want to think about, how you're going to um, redesign or reconfigure your workspace to make sure that you're within the restrictions. The other thing you may want to think about is stocking on PPEs. And I'm you know, not trying to create a rush into ordering a bunch of uh, PPEs, but when the restrictions do ease up, I think that it's likely that we'll still have to continue using face masks and, uh, and gloves, like a lot of people are using now. I don't know if it's going to be mandatory or not, but it's probably going to be recommended so long as we have the virus going on. Um, so even if it's not a requirement, you may want to think about starting to order that so you have that when you're ready to open up. Um, that, that, that's of course assuming that anyone can find them. Well, and that's the other thing, right? I mean, yes, you're right. Um, there is more supply coming online, but uh, and we've seen actually, I should give a lot of credit to many of the manufacturers in Vaughan have actually converted 
uh, aspects of manufacturing lines to do PPE equipment. So uh, I did want to give a shout out to all those who are who are doing that. It's very significant, but obviously that's right now for the average business, it's a challenge to get uh, masks and what have you. So yeah. if you had to pick though, let's say the top three things that an employer could start doing now to prepare their work for, workplace for the eventual return of employees, what would that be based on what the list you just gave? Um, I would probably think about the physical space first, because again, if we're following Saskatchewan, it looks like we will have those, uh, those limits on people in the same space. Uh, so think about how you can take, if you have a large workforce, what you, you can do to limit um, how many people are going to be there at the same time. Are you going to stagger shifts? Are you going to stagger breaks maybe? Um, are you going to implement a screening process? And if so, will people be in line? Um, is there a place for them to be in line? Like those really um, practical considerations that you may have already had to deal with before the shutdown as well. I know a lot of workplaces have done that. That's probably good. Well, and, and I, 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 listen, we, nobody knows, nobody has the true crystal ball, but right. I do believe that we're going to see um, some businesses and especially those in office environments enable more of their employees to continue to work from home uh, on some kind of shift basis. Uh, and in normal times, that would have been great for employees because they'd help reduce traffic congestion and not get so frustrated with the daily commute. Boy, does that feel like a million years ago for all of us now. But uh, I, I, th I think people are going to continue to use telework as one option to try and create physical distancing in small office places. And I think that's important. Uh, it's a very important point. And if that's what you're going to do, first of all, is this something that you, you'll, you'll permit your employees to do and you'll be able to do as a business? And if so, do you have a uh, remote working policy to make sure that uh, that is being confidential, to make sure that, that employees keep documents in a specific place, that they don't let clients come into their home, those sorts of things, right? They're all important. It's one thing when nobody can leave their house right now to have people working from home. But if you're going to do it during um, regular times, then you should have a policy outlining exactly what employees can and can't do and expectations, right? Um, and if you're not going to permit employees to work from home going forward, um, you need to think about what happens when they come and ask for it. What's the answer going to be? What is the reason going to be? Is it reasonable? Um, and, um, you know, what you're going to do when employees ask for it generally. And Actually, that, that, uh, sorry, I, I think that raises a really interesting point, though. So, okay, so right now, if an employee feels uncomfortable going to work because of safety concern, health issue to do with COVID-19, can they refuse work right now? Physically to go into work? Yes, physically. That, yeah. that depends on the industry. I think that would depend on the industry. For example, in the healthcare sector, that's an industry that comes with a higher risk to employees naturally. And so the expectation there is going to be different than a, a supermarket, for example. It doesn't typically come with those risks. So I think you've got to take it on an industry by industry basis. Um, and if you've put up all of the protections that you could have put up, and, and again, as an employer, you have a requirement to keep your employees safe always. Uh, if you've done everything you can do to keep them safe and, and they're still refusing, then you may get into a work refusal situation. You may have to involve the Ministry of Labor, uh, and there's a whole process in law um, to go through that. But now, a lot of employers have put all the protections that they could at this point. And so most employees aren't refusing. And those who are employers have to deal with them on a case-by-case -case basis. They may have somebody at home who's got a compromised immune system. Right? That's right. That so yeah. I think it all depends. Well, actually, the reason, the reason I asked, but I realized it was two questions. So I did that one first, is, is I was wondering when businesses start to return to normal operations, and they've taken precautions to support their employees in terms of safety, physical distancing. Can an employee at that point refuse to go into work and say, I wanna be working from home, I still don't feel safe. The virus is still in society, I'd like to work from home. Is that also a case by case? I, I think that the answer is exactly the same. It depends on the industry. I think it depends on what the employer has done in terms of uh, protecting employees and the employee's personal circumstances and what, what's happening at home and whether there's somebody that they are concerned about at home. Um, you know, they may not show any symptoms, but they may bring the virus into the house, which will affect somebody else much a much greater extent. So it's still on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think we're gonna see a lot of that, obviously, as businesses are opening up because uh, you don't know. Um, and now there's, there's, a new, um, there's a new issue that has come up that some employees, some uh, individuals may have an immunity to the virus once they've had it, they don't know yet. 
And if that happens, will the employer have the right to kind of return the, those employees who already had the virus and therefore have an immunity and how that's going to affect the workplace? So there are a lot of issues that might stem out of um, the return to work when that actually happens. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and another question we got, uh, slightly different, to similar topic, is when a business is ready to return employees to work, do employees have to be reinstated to their previous role? Um, if the previous role exists, I would say yes, especially if they're on the leave. If you, when you're putting an employee in leave of absence, it's a job protected leave and the, the job that's protected is the employee's job. So if the job does exist, then certainly I recommend returning them to that job. But we also know that um, now everything will probably be changing when businesses return to work. Some roles are going to be gone. Um, some roles are going to be jigged around and added to other roles. So to the extent that you can offer employees a similar role to what they had before, uh, certainly in terms of responsibility, but definitely in terms of compensation, I encourage you to do so. Um, and the more you change the role, the more you reduce the compensation, the more you change the duties, the more you're getting yourself into a constructive dismissal situation. So think about that. Um, if the employee signs off on, on change in their, in their role, for example, and you give them some sort of a signing bonuses consideration, you should be okay as long as you're not forcing them to. So if their job is eliminated or if you, you're trying to, for example, merge their position with another position, have them agree to it, sign off, give them something as a signing bonus and you should be okay. But I think the greater you get away, the more you get away from their previous role, the more you're getting yourself into um, a constructive dismissal situation, certainly. I, I wanna ask you a really practical <clears throat> follow-up question to that. <clears throat> if, um, if you work with an employee and you give them a signing bonus, as an example, and you wanna reposition their role at the business and they agree to it, do you recommend doing a whole new employment contract or can it be a one page addendum to their existing contract? Some of it depends on what is in the contract in the first place. Some contracts actually provide for those types of changes and in that case, you have to do nothing. You just change their role because both parties agreed in the very beginning, their role can be changed. If that's not the case, you can do an amending agreement like you've, you've mentioned and have them, the amending agreement continues to incorporate the original employment contract, uh, but outlines the change and outlines the consideration and that should be uh, good enough. I don't think you need a new employment contract unless the role is very, very different, the compensation is very different and you've really changed their, their job altogether. You may want to think about a new employment contract in that case, but even then I think that if all other terms and conditions remain the same, you can probably do just an amending agreement. Thank you. No, thanks for uh, that's because it's one of those. I've heard that question even before COVID nineteen. Uh, yeah. So thanks for taking that. Uh, another question was: If a business can a business recall employees but reduce their hours or wages? Uh, again, it depends, like everything else, and it depends yeah. really on the amount of reduction that you're you're talking about. So the best thing to do, I think, is be honest with employees and say everybody knows what the situation is. And say, look, we're, we're opening up, we're ramping it back up. We don't have full-time hours just yet. We can offer you X. If the employee agrees, then again, have them sign off on it in writing. Give them some sort of a signing bonus as consideration and it, you should be okay. Um, even without an employee signing off though, if you're changing their compensation or their hours a little bit, um, typically the threshold, unofficial threshold is 10%. You should be okay, but the the higher um, the, the higher you get from the ten percent threshold, um, the more you're getting into a constructive dismissal situation as well. So try to um, if you do change it significantly, try to get them to sign off on it. And that way, you have very little legal risk. But at the end of the day, practically, you'll do what you need to do to get your business up and running, right? And hopefully, um, your employees are yeah, your employees are. Um, gain and, and participating in it. And, you know, I think honesty and working with your employees is going to get you very far in this situation. Okay, thank you. And, and this next question is about the distinction amongst, amongst the employees at the workforce. So can a company recall some employees, but extend the layoff or leave for others? Maybe again. Um, so well, it's, it's, all, it's all exactly it's all case by case, but yeah, let's see. Oh, go ahead. The, the law is always a maybe. Um, so the temporary layoffs are really implemented when there is a lack of work. And so you have to keep that in, in mind. If you have lack of work for some employees still, but work for other employees, then certainly you can recall those employees you have work for. Um, let's say you have sales work, but you don't have, you know, I, I don't know, another position. 
So um, you can recall those who you have worked for and those who you don't, you can leave on a temporary layoff. Um, but again, you have to keep in mind that first of all, your reasons can be discriminatory. So they cannot be based on age or sex or pregnancy or race or any of those grounds that are enumerated in the human rights code. That's very important. Um, and you should also perhaps speak to your, your employees first because some employees may prefer to stay at home because you have children at home who don't have school yet. Um, and they want to spend more time at home because really out of lack of choice sometimes. So you may be in a situation where you don't have to pick and choose you can actually um, have employees who will tell you they, they prefer to stay at home and then you bring back those who don't have those obligations back to work. So again, it's a purely business decision. I would just make a list of all your employees and their circumstances to your knowledge and then take it from there and see who you can and can't return. I expect that most businesses will not be able to return everybody at the same time altogether right in the beginning. It's gonna be a gradual return to work. And I think these decisions will have to be made certainly going forward. Yeah, I, th I think I think you're right. Um, <clears throat> this uh, this question we received, it's similar to some of the topics you've gone over, but let's ask it. Um, so how do you deal with employees who are afraid of coming back to work because of fears of dealing with COVID-19? It's less a question of compelling or, or agreements, and it's more about just the human psyche and how do you make people feel calm and know that they have the support of the business when they come back to work. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the first thing, the main thing you should do, and with a lot of these issues in this one as well, is really be upfront and, and honest with them. Um, one of the things that I think some business businesses are going to implement uh, when, when employees are coming back are temperature checks and, you know, checklists about symptoms. And those are things that right. you may have already done before the shutdown. Um, and that may make employees, some employees comfortable to know that you are screening everybody who's coming to the workplace, whether it's a visitor or an employee. Um, and of course, before I do temperature checks, I really suggest you speak to your lawyer because there are some, as you can imagine, some um, consequences that may flow from that with respect to privacy, but it's certainly lots of businesses are doing it and it can be done. Um, and so if you reassure employees that you've done everything you can in terms of screening individuals coming in, social distancing, sanitation of the workplace, um, I think that you're going to ease their mind uh, before they come back as well. Um, at the end of the day, you can only do what you can, right, to, to prevent the spread of the virus. Um, if you can offer them working from home, that's one thing that you can do as well if that works with your business. You can, people are going to be nervous. I think everybody's going to be nervous coming back. And I think that um, the way our current provincial government has been going forward on this is very cautiously. So I think that if we get to a point where we're talking about going back to work, um, at least the health authorities are going to be comfortable letting some people back back into the workplaces. So that's a bit of a comfort as well. Yeah, and I, I, I think what, when we were talking upper levels of government, uh, it's quite clear they're, they're taking a cautious safety first approach, uh, trying to support the business community. We see a real united front from all three levels of government trying to support business, uh, doing some programs much faster than uh, we've ever seen before. It's still a super challenge for everybody, uh, certainly in terms of liquidity. Um, but ultimately, I think we're going to see a phased back approach to work. And uh, so hopefully we'll, um, we'll, we'll see a phased approach back to work and hopefully uh, we'll all be healthy as we do that. Um, how much notice do you need to give an employee before you bring them back to work? It depends on why they're not working. If they are on a temporary layoff, for example, you don't have to give them any notice. And, and before COVID-19, I always said, give them a week in writing just so they can arrange their affairs and know what they're doing a week from now. Um, but realistically, you don't have to give them anything. You can say, we're opening up tomorrow. Uh, we'd like you to start coming back to work tomorrow. And is that, but is that really realistic to expect someone to be able to just come in on one day's notice? Yeah, really, like I said, realistically, I like to give at least a week, but okay. legally, you don't have to. That's from layoffs. The leave is the same. Um, again, the leave is going to be in place as long as the emergency order is in place. So if you some, have somebody on the paid leave, the emergency, um, the infectious disease emergency paid leave, then you will, you, you will have to wait until the emergency order is lifted before you can um, ask them to come back to work. If they're prepared to come back voluntarily, that's obviously not an issue. But if they're home because there's an emergency order, you'll have to wait until that is over. Right. Um, so those really are the two situations you'll have employees sitting at home. Um, I think that 
practically, the more notice you give, the better. You will know, uh, based again on Saskatchewan's experience, what, what we've seen from the plan that was released yesterday, there are weeks and weeks of notice before they, before they allow businesses to open up again. So I think most businesses will have enough time to plan on the HR side to give employees notice that they will be coming back three, four weeks into the future. And that way the employees can arrange their affairs at home, make sure that there's somebody to take care of the kids and so on before they come back. Hmm. Fair enough. Now, now um, I have a question from Maria from Pico, uh, one of our uh, longstanding members, they're actually one of our neighbors. And you've covered aspects of it. It's, it's a, I'm, I'm gonna ask it, there might be a couple questions in there, just, but let's, let's go through it. Um, okay. So the first one we've covered, uh, what precautions and processes should employers consider as we contemplate staff returning to work to the office? There's a bit more. For instance, might it be necessary to have employees sign an agreement or a policy with their employer for COVID-19 similar to health and safety practices? And what other precautions would be recommended so that we can reasonably limit liability should they contract or spread COVID-19? So the question of liability of employees contract um, COVID-19 at work is actually a WSIB question. It's uh, considered to be a workplace accident if somebody does. So um, it will be really the same type of liability. And um, if you have WSIB and most, most businesses do, you know what the process is. So just keep that in mind. If they contract it outside of the workplace, then you know it's completely out of your hands. Um, one of the things that we haven't talked about, but I think is important to mention is, is workplace policies. You should have I mean, you should look at the policies that you have now. I'm making the assumption that they don't address social distancing and, and those sorts of things. So if you put in a policy, everybody's on the same page, everybody knows what the expectations are. So I definitely recommend that you take a look at that. Um, have a pandemic policy for next time this happens. Hopefully there won't be a next time, but you know, we know now that you never know. A remote working policy, all those things, the more you can put in policy in terms of procedure, the more certainty you're going to have amongst your employees. Everybody's going to be on the same page. So I highly recommend that. I think that's a good idea. Was there another part to the question, Brian? Um, no, I, 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 I'm just looking at it again. No, I think, I mean, you covered the, the liability. We, we certainly covered things that you could do to prepare your workplace for coming back to work. And then there was the aspect of whether you should do a policy agreement, which you covered. So that, thank you for that. Do you... Okay. Is there anything um, about seasonal workers? Like think about uh, day camps or um, sports leagues that theoretically would have been starting, let's say in June. Um, they may come back a little bit later. I don't, I don't want to predict. So yeah. in which case, is there anything about you know, bringing back the employees in those situations or bringing them on? Because maybe there's seasonal employees that, that haven't been employed recently. Is there any employment advice that you give specific to that sector? I think it would be much of the same um, because everybody's kind of in a position where they haven't worked for a while or a lot of employees are. Um, if you are a camp, for example, and you do think you will open up in August as opposed to July, now is probably the time to start planning that. Um, I would imagine that those employees are, would be very happy to come back to work. Um, some of them may not even qualify for the SERB benefits because they didn't have that $5,000 in income in the last year in 2019 if they've only worked a little bit of the season. So I imagine that you're going to get a lot of um, buy from the employees to come back. So the same planning, I think, would apply to them. I just wouldn't take the planning, um, and I'm saying this kind of cautiously, very far because we have uh, our deadlines, our, our, our social distancing and the emergency order keeps on getting pushed back. So uh, we, everybody in the beginning thought we'd be back by summer and now we know we're probably not gonna be back by July. I know summer camps are being canceled left, right and center in July. They're probably going to be canceled in August. So if you're in a seasonal worker, there's uh, I think a good chance depending on which industry that you're in, there's a good chance that, that uh, things aren't going to open up for the summer, um, for the spring, certainly. So plan, but, you know, plan cautiously and slowly, I think. Uh, it's we have predict. A, That's the problem. It's really hard to predict what's going to happen because well, things change daily right now. So, you know, you, you said it perfect. It's, it's uh, changing all the time all the policies, we just, it's health and safety first, but obviously you gotta, we're trying to reopen the economy properly and, and think now about how we're gonna position ourselves for the future. Um, one of our members, um, Tamara Fontana, is asking about um, 
I'll, I'll read you the question. Would government supports for business be limited for new employees during their probation period with a new employer? So someone who's starting with a new employer uh, soon, mm -hmm. and they normally have uh, you know, a certain probationary period, would it be any different because of COVID-19 in your opinion? The probationary period? Yeah. I don't I, think that- uh, I would I suspect no. Yeah. yeah, I mean, government supports, I don't, the ones that have been implemented for COVID-19 at least, don't really distinguish uh, the length of service or the size of employer. I mean, they've really been trying to apply them across the board to all employers, all employees, or as many as they can include. So I don't think that probationary employees are going to be in a much of a different position as anyone else coming back to work. If they're uh, and, then, and then she did, she did have a follow-up question. <clears throat> so if you have an employee that was a new employee and we're still under their probation period before COVID-19 mm -hmm. and before COVID-19 impacted operations roughly in March, how many days will they, will they have needed to work with a new company before being eligible for EI or CERB? For CERB, I don't think that there is a limit. Um, EI used to be insurable earnings, so you had to have a certain number of hours in a period of time leading up to applying for EI, regardless of which employer you're with. So the, the fact that they were probationary with one employer didn't really matter. It's how many insurable hours they had before they applied. I don't believe there is a, there is a limit for CERB. For CERB pretty much actually, I, I actually think it's a great question and it's a great answer because just building on what you're saying, I, I, I think that's absolutely right about EI. And in terms of the CERB, it's about how much money you earned in the previous 12 month periods or did you earn, what is, it's still $5,000 in, in the previous year or the previous 12 months, correct? Correct, and, uh, and um, you have to be without income for 14 days. You're not working for 14 days. Oh, that's a good point, yeah. 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 So if you're in between jobs or you managed to pick something else up and you didn't have the 14-day break, you won't be able to apply for CERB. Right. So, so Tamara, to, to go a bit further on that question, if the employee, and Ina, please jump in, but if the employee was working, let's say, three weeks in March, that income could count towards the income they earned in the previous 12 months. They still need five thousand total in that month in twelve months, or five thousand in twenty nineteen in and of itself, and then they have to be unemployed for at least fourteen days, as Ina said, to be able to apply for the serve. Hopefully that that helps. Okay, so um, we're at the one hour mark. Uh, I really wanted to thank you, Ina, but before I wrap up, I just put it back to you. If there's any, uh, you know, um, any further advice you wanted to give people or any message from yourself or Miller Thompson, then we'll kick it back to me and I'll just give some concluding remarks. I think that it's important for businesses to stay, stay flexible and patient. Um, I think this is gonna be a long return back to business and that if you're just patient and think flexibly about your workplace and what you can do, I know that a lot of businesses pre-COVID-19 would never have uh, allowed employees to work from home. Sorry, my cat's in the way here. I uh, would never allow employees to work from home. That's the, it's the new normal. It's okay. Oh, what can you do? It, in the background of my house, I keep hearing the song Frozen that my daughter keeps playing. So <laughs> we all have this, yes. We don't have that here, but um, so, you know, keep, be flexible and think of, of new and innovative uh, ways to operate your business. It may be a while, it may be a very slow return, so as long as you're not rigid and uh, in the old ways that the business had before COVID-19, I think you'll be successful. Um, I was speaking to a couple of business owners yesterday about pivoting your business, and it was uh, something that really stuck with me. If you're, if you're the kind of person who can just think of new ways to just pivot your business to something else and to adapt to how things are, to how quickly things are happening around you right now, I think you'll be successful with the return. Um, so just be flexible. I think is the key. Yeah. No, I really appreciate, I, I appreciate the calmness of your tone and also your cat. We need a bit of levity. And by the way, Ina, we're going to continue to have this video on our website and YouTube. So the reality is, you know, they say cat videos get way more hits. So I'm sure it'll become even more popular. No, exactly. Now, we, now it will for sure. So I, I did a uh, quick question though. If, if businesses do want to reach out to you personally, is there a best way to do that? Or would you like them to just go through us? Um, they could go through you. I should probably left my uh, screen up. Um, I don't know if you could see it as well. Can you see my screen now? Oh, yes, slides, Brian. So here's yep. my contact information is on there. Just let me end here, right there. Um, if you do have any questions, I'm happy to chat. Send me an email. Give me a call. Um, that number goes to myself, so I'm available on that number, even though I'm not in the office right now. 
Um, and, or they can go through you, Brian. I'm happy to, to chat with any members through you as well. No, I, I really appreciate it. And you know, one, one thing is, uh, as I mentioned at the outset, at the Vaughn Chamber uh, website, we have a page that's easy to access. You go to the home page, the top, it says COVID-19 business resources. You click that, it goes to a site that in real time is updated with all the new government supports for business from all levels, pretty much real time. And then from there, you can get business tips from employment lawyers and accountants and others. And Ina, you know, the, the thing that's gonna stay with me about our chat is, is the way you talked about how a business could position itself now for thinking about what it has to do to ensure safety later when the employees come back. So as Miller Thompson develops uh, briefs on those kind of tips, we, we'd love to post that on our website. Just send them to me and we'll make sure they get up. Absolutely, and we'll do that. Thank you. We actually post daily updates, so everything that, that happens, and lots happens every day, believe it or not, across the country. We do a cross-country update on all of the new uh, laws and changes, and so we'll send that to you to, to post on your website. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, so um, with that, I wanted to thank you, Ina Koldor from Miller Thompson, employment lawyer, for uh, for going through some of the business supports and then specifically uh, aspects of uh, labor and employment law with us, thinking about COVID-19. Uh, again, we're going to be doing more business uh, resource uh, talks like this going forward, more town halls with our elected officials. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And uh, as I concluded in the past, just stay well, stay safe, stay healthy, and we look forward to uh, a recovery, hopefully sooner than later. Thank you all. Thank you for having me, Brian.